Well, I didn't want to get the Facebook folks, man. I've already done a Twitter Q&A, so I decided i give the people that want to submit their questions on Facebook the platform an opportunity to do so. So here we go. Time for the Facebook Q&A. If you want to submit your questions via Twitter in the future, I'll put the Twitter link for the show in the description box. If you usually submit them on Twitter and are looking for the show's Facebook page, I'll put that link in the description box. That way we're covering all the bases and everybody's happy. Alrighty, I haven't pre-screened these, so I'm going to be going through, so there could be bits of choppiness here and here and there and all of that stuff. Um, and if I get really loud with the volume of my voice, I will try, if I know it's coming, to prepare you ahead of time, so that way if you're wearing headphones, you can maybe turn them into earmuffs. I don't really know. Alright, so Lawrence Williams. Which kind of characters are best for professional wrestling? Realistic characters are cartoon-like characters. Um... In the most sincere, smart-ass sounding, yet honest way I possibly can, characters, period. It doesn't fucking matter. The problem with the WWE today is that they lack in characters. Interesting characters, realistic characters, cartoon-like characters, larger-than-life characters. It doesn't fucking matter. They just don't have characters, period. Period. I mean, if it's true that they're focusing on the athletes, well, there have to be better athletes out there than some of the guys that they have. I'm just being honest. So you can't even get that right. And, of course, that would epitomize just how boring professional wrestling has come stateside. Is that the only thing that matters? No, people need characters to get behind. They need characters to get invested in. The best type of characters in professional wrestling are the ones that don't suck. There you go. Chris Gwilliam, who should be the next guy to win their first WWE World Heavyweight Championship? Um, probably Roman. Probably Roman. You know, who else? Hey, obviously I got to throw Ambrose in there, but again, if the company's not going to get behind him, then what the fuck difference does it make? Yeah, you get that cheap thrill. If Ambrose won the belt, oh, and then he would actually be semi-main and Cena and whatever he's involved in would be the main event. I'm just saying. So it might be best at this point in time if the next guy to win their first WWE World Heavyweight title was going to be a Roman Reigns. Unless you really wanted to get on board Kevin Owens, but that's a different story for a different time. Trevor Clark, do you think CM Punk, if given the opportunity, could have been bigger than the likes of Triple H? Do you think Punk was already more talented than him? Uh, I guess it's a matter of perspective. Um... As far as whether he was more talented than Triple H, he most, well, certainly wasn't more talented on the political side and the positioning side. And honestly, that might be the only talent that really matters in the WWE. So if we go off of the talent that the fans think about the most, Punk could maybe be of an equivalent talent. If we go off of the talent that frankly fucking matters at the end of the day, Triple H buries, poons, butt rapes, and destroys CM Punk. Period. Uh, could he have been bigger than the likes of Triple H if given the opportunity? You had one shot for that to ever happen. That was the WWE Summer of Punk in 2011. Um, never say never, but probably not. So you got to remember, Triple H has a lot of history there, a lot of time in terms of name recognition. And he goes back to an era that two to three times the amount of people were watching wrestling and WWF programming on a consistent basis. So based off of the decreased size of the overall audience? No, CM Punk, even if given the opportunity, could never have been better than the likes of Triple H because there's no way the WWE could sit there and get that type of audience again. I'm just being honest. Uh, Luke Harris, what's the most offensive thing Vince McMahon has ever done? Um, Most offensive would probably be the fact that he's never had a black man hold his number one world title. Mark Henry winning the World Heavyweight Championship does not count. The Rock does not count because The Rock counts himself as Samoan and not black. End of discussion. End of argument. That's the most offensive thing that Vince has never done, or ever done, is never had a black man hold his number one belt. I mean, it's just, well, not the fucking 60s anymore. It's not the 70s anymore. You would think if the most important color was green, that... The WWE would get on board with the black athlete, you would think. Shay Delane, why is professional wrestling so bad at the moment? 
because nobody has any clue of what the fuck they want to do. Nobody knows how the hell to get there. Everybody thinks they know what the hell they're talking about, and frankly, nobody knows what the fuck they're talking about. The people running wrestling companies are clueless and completely out of touch with reality and anywhere close to mainstream. You've got wrestling fans that are fractured into so many different factions. Nobody can be pleased by the same fucking thing. you got the people producing and writing wrestling shows thinking that everything they do is great because they've been doing it that way for so long and it's fucking shit. Wrestling people live in their wrestling bubble, so to speak. The fans are living in their bubble. It's just... I mean, there are so many reasons, but you know, I could say it's a lack of talent in the business, a lack of creativity in the business, a lack of originality in the business. It's many, many things. But yes, it is bad at the moment. I agree. Uh, Claude Thomas, thoughts on the ongoing feud between Jim Cornette and Vince Russo? All right, here is a spin I'll put on it that I'm not sure I've heard anybody ever say. Usually people will take a side on this, and because of the way Cornette says it, they usually take his side. I compare Vince Russo versus Jim Cornette to the GOP versus the Democratic Party. Jim Cornette represents the Democratic Party, yeah, believe it or not, where he's maybe a little more um, charismatic in the way he does things or flamboyant in the way he does things, the way he always goes, me against the system, us against the world, everybody's out to get him, everybody else is to blame, there is no self-accountability, kind of fits a lot of ways with the Democratic Party of today. Whereas Vince Russo will sit there and hold on to this little glimmer of something from many, many years ago, in this case over a decade and a half ago, as if he was the only reason that it happened when he was only one bit piece into why something happened, when so many other came, things perfectly came into play. And he continues to hold on to that. All the while, numerous times he has been given the opportunity to you know, basically produce he has been given that opportunity several times to show his worth, to prove it, and he has failed to do so time and time again. That's the Republican Party of today. So you've got this idiot on this side of the fence talking all this shit, and all the while he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. You've got this guy on the other side of the fence that people kind of like a little bit more because he's a little more out there and charismatic and entertaining in the way he presents his argument. But at the end of the day, he's clueless, out of touch, and doesn't know what the fuck he's doing or talking about. They take two divergent paths to ultimately arrive at the same spot. That is the American two-party bullshit political system of today, perfectly embodied by Vince Russo and Jim Cornette. When I hear either one of them, frankly, talk about professional wrestling at this point in time, in the state of professional wrestling at this point in time, I always wonder if either one of them could ever sit there and take responsibility for what they do. Russo will blame the Cornette type of way of thinking. Cornette will blame the Russo type of way of thinking. Either way, both of these asshats have had many times to get it right, and they still fuck it up. When was the last time that either of them really did something great in wrestling? When was the last time either one of them actually made a star in wrestling? It's been a decade. And more. That's who they are, though. And all the shit they talk about each other, especially Cornette and Russo, it's the same old shit. They're the Republicans and Democrats. Two idiotic fucks. All right. Now, Lawrence Williams also asked, if offered, would I take Ke uh, Kevin Dunn's job? Well, one, I'd never be offered that. Two, if I was ever offered, would I take it? No, only on one condition. And that would be that the company would be run a real corp way a real corporation should be run. And that is, is if I'm in charge of the television, if I am in charge of the production of the television, then I'm going to be the HNIC of all that you see when it comes to the television and said television production. I'm not going to have my boss undercutting me and telling me how he wants it done and that I'm going to have to do it that way. No, you are putting me in that position at that level because you are supposed to trust in me to do it right. You are going to allow me to do my core job competency. You are going to measure me based off of my performance. And if that's going to be the case, I'm going to do it my way, the way that I see best and let the results bear out and let me be judged as such. I'm not going to be sit there and judge negatively because this old senior coot above me is telling me what the fuck to do and then I'm going to take the heat for that? You're fucking insane. No. When it comes to the production of the television show, I'm the one that runs the show. It means everybody comes to me. At the end of the day, 
I'm the one that is accountable for it, and that accountability goes from me to the man in Vince. It doesn't mean Vince undercutting me, Vince telling me what to do, Vince talking into the freaking commentator's ear. None of that shit. That all ends. That's my shit. That, if you're asking me the one thing I would require, that would be it. Is that you let me do it my way, and then you hold me accountable based off of the performance. It's not going to work any other way. And even for all the shit people want to say about Kevin Dunn, and a lot of it true, how could he even succeed in that environment? It's not a healthy corporate structure. Even when these people are responsible for their individual competencies, whether it's Triple H or Stephanie or Kevin Dunn or what have you, George Barrios, whoever, at the end of the day, Vince is still fucking interfering. Vince is still putting final say on everything. That's not the way it should go. Vince, as the CEO or as the chairman of the board, as you would say, is supposed to be that liaison between the corporation and the shareholders. He should have very little to do, frankly, with the day-to-day -day operations. Everybody should be bringing the ideas to him, bouncing it around, and then they're the ones that ultimately do it. And he shouldn't be sitting there and freaking inter interjecting and sitting there and mingling and doing all this other crap. He should be sitting back and overseeing everything and then holding people accountable for their good or bad performances. So as much as we want to knock on a freaking Bugsy Beaver, if you want to call him that, how could he even succeed in that type of environment? Uh, Stephen Bradley, what if Hogan, Nash, and Scott Hall never went to WCW and formed the NWO and WWF? How different would the wrestling business be, and how different would the Monday Night Wars be? I mean, obviously, it'd be a lot different. I don't even know if you'd ever have the Monday Night Wars. Uh, obviously, the wrestling business would be very different. Um, if Hogan, Nash, and Scott Hall never went to WCW... It might have been the worst thing that could have ever happened to WWF, too, because those guys would have continued to hog the top spots for the next several years. All the while, guys like Austin Rock, Foley, Triple H, and so many others might have never gotten off the ground. Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, you name it. Dev Devon Sanders. Will Kevin Owens main event WrestleMania next year, or will he be a play a big part of WrestleMania? I bet very strongly against him main eventing WrestleMania. There's a very good chance he will be in a featured role at WrestleMania, yes. So he could be in one of those four or five matches that the show will be built around, and he probably should be. That's not guaranteed, though, especially once he's done working with Cena. You might think you know, but you don't know at this point. Um, but with that said, Davon, um, SpongeBob, SpongeBob sucks, so do you, and so does Kevin Owens. No, I'm kidding about that last part, at least. The first two are absolutely correct. Jonathan Bittman, what's more important in wrestling, having a good character, having good promo skill skills, or having good in-ring skills? Honestly, out of the three, being good in the ring is the least important historically throughout the history of the business in the WWE. Now, however, you can take somebody that's good in the ring and make that a very big component of their character and have that be who they are. So, you know, it's one of those things. It can work in lockstep. A guy with really good promo skills and a really good character but so-so in the ring can still be a star. A guy that's great in the ring but really doesn't have much of a character? Eh. But you give a guy that's really good in the ring and he's either you know, hopefully good on the mic or you make that who he is and his identity and make a good character out of that, he could be a star too. Personally, if I had to have any of the three, you know, I think promo skills and good in-ring skills um, kind of tie into being a character, so that's a little bit different. I'd personally rather have the promo skills over the in-ring skills. That's just me. Davey Jefferson. Of all the guys who never were WWE champion, who had the best character? Um, I'll go Jake the Snake. So I thought he was the best at being able to work on either side of the fence. He was the best in terms of, uh, you know, feeling real, um, making things kind of personal. I mean, you could sit there and say that Piper had a great character, DiBiase had a great character, but I'll go Jake. That's just a personal preference of mine. Uh, let's see here. Lenny Yancey, how did WWE go from Divas main eventing Raw to not caring about them? 
Uh, because the WWE did it Vince's way, and Vince's way is that women are objects, and they don't really matter. It's a man's business, and men are how you draw money, which, again, is completely and totally fucking ridiculous. It just speaks to how out of touch Vince McMahon is. Seriously. Whether you like it or not, Vince, women are an ever-important part of society. And while you would like to think about nothing more than all the hot women are lesbians who, in their free time from rubbing muffs and 69ing, are sharing recipes and making you cupcakes, there's more to them than that. There is. You know, and they matter. And it's this whole thing of just completely being out of touch with the reality of the times. You know, and the fact that this company still, after all these years, can't figure out that some of their biggest stars of the Attitude Era were individuals like Sable in China, and then later on, the ladies like the Tories and the Trishes and the Stacys and the Litas. I mean, all of them, you could argue in ways, are bigger stars than anybody on the full-time roster today. And I will repeat that again. Anybody. Anybody. Nobody on that active full-time roster of WWE has ever been as hot as, let's say, Sable was in that 98, 99 type of time frame. No way. Same thing with China. Or Trish. Or Lita. I mean, seriously. It's just old men being stuck in old ways. I mean, so that's a good kind of way I look at it. Uh, Brandon Harden, honestly, how much longer do you think we see Seth Rollins as champion? Uh, maybe SummerSlam, maybe a little bit longer. I'm not sure how much longer we'll go. Steve Jacobson, was the 1990s the last great decade? I mean, I'd ask about the 90s, what was so great about it? Because a lot of the things that happened in the 2000s were the result of things that were set in motion in the 90s, and especially Reagan's 80s. And what made the 90s such a great decade? Just asking. I grew up in that decade. You know, I grew up in the 80s, too, obviously. But it became a man, so to speak, in the 90s. What's so fucking great about that decade? Yeah, technological advances were outstanding and everything else, but millions of people lost their ass when the dot-com bubble burst. Lots of people lost their, you know, their retirements, uh, their futures when these crooked corporations like Enron and WorldCom went belly up. You know, I mean, so there are a lot of things you sit there. And for those of you that believe the official narratives about 9-11 and war on terrorism and all that shit, well, look at all the shit that happened in the 90s or didn't happen in the 90s that allowed that crap to happen in the 2000s. I don't think the 90s were all that great of a decade. I really, really don't. James Forkham, what should WWE do with Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam? Who do you... Uh, I don't know. Maybe a rematch with Rollins? I don't know. That's a good question. Thomas Hughes, besides the sports and entertainment of wrestling and football, what other hobbies do you find yourself enjoying in your spare time? Uh, masturbation. <laughs> I'm joking. Or am I? Sex with the old lady. And no, this is not old and this is not lady. This is not Pamela. This is not Rosie. So fuck you, guys. Um... Other serious hobbies, though. I enjoy reading up on history. I enjoy um, talking about politics. I enjoy uh, other sports as well. I love golf. I love track and field. Um, i trying to think what other hobbies do I have. Obviously, this is a hobby as well. So, you know, lots of hobbies. Lots of interesting things, at least interesting to me. Uh, let's see here. AK Infinity. Oh, this is this could be a really good question. How would Triple H react if one of his daughters had a black boyfriend and was a wrestler? Do you think he would be hot shotted? If by hot shotted you mean built up so that way he could be booked to wrestle Triple H so Triple H could beat his ass repeatedly at live events and on multiple pay per views, then yes, he would be hot shotted. <laughs> now I notice your question didn't ask. What would happen if Triple H's son 
day was dating a black woman because that wouldn't happen because before anything else, Triple H would have to be able to produce a son. That's daddy's fault. The man is God, but he can't make a son. Shame on him. Shame on him. Oh, I could only imagine his reaction, and it probably wouldn't be very good. Vince would probably be proud of the reaction. Just saying. Uh, Darren Godf Godfrey, do you think the next big megastar is currently on the main WWE roster, or is he in NXT, or do you not see a future megastar for this company? Bingo! How the fuck could anybody be a megastar? No, Cena's not a fucking megastar. There is no megastar. And even Lesnar, I'd, I'd argue, is not a megastar. If he was that big of a megastar, their ratings when he's on TV would be much, much better. Their WWE Network numbers would explode a lot more than they do when Lesnar appears. They have no megastars in terms of guys that are full-time or somewhat quasi-full-time. They don't have a single megastar, and I don't see one coming down the pike anytime soon. Uh, Antoine Dupree, I have two questions. First... Was the South during the Civil War uh, a bunch of traitors? Yes. Perfectly outlined in the Constitution, what they did was treason. Therefore, by committing treasonous acts and being citizens of the Union, that would have made them traitors. No matter how much the pro-South spin has been put into your history books throughout the past 150 years, it doesn't change the fact that they were traitors. That doesn't make the Union any better. That doesn't make the United States of America and its flag any better. It really doesn't. And then his other question is, why are people trying to remove slavery from the history books? I don't think they're trying to remove slavery from the history books. I think part of what you're talking about is the creative spin that has been put into our history books over the past 150 years especially starting with the Reconstruction time and going forward, in part the North wanting not to piss off the South, uh, the South still being bitter about the fact that they lost the Civil War, uh, both sides being bitter at each other for certain things, uh, trying to keep the peace, whatever the case might be. But yeah, somewhere along the way, this lie came into play that the South seceded over states' rights, which is complete and total bullshit. They seceded because of slavery, period. There is no argument that could be made to sit there and say, because if anything, they seceded in part because of other states executing their individual states' rights to not enforce a Fugitive Slave Act. The thing is, is somewhere along the way, it became about not pissing off the South, and it became about not wanting to seem too overbearing, especially with the evils of what happened during the Civil War, especially towards the tail end, Sherman's march to Atlanta, how horribly botched... Uh, the Reconstruction period was. I mean, there's a lot of different things. The South always is like, you damn Yankees. And these people up north are like, you fucking rebels. And it's just shit. These underlying wounds that have never been healed over 150 years. The North trying to sit there and act superior to the Southern states. The Southern states trying to act superior to the Northern states. And frankly, they all need to shut the fuck up because they all have fucking skeletons in their closet. You can't sit there and spin them. You can't sit there and turn away from them. You know, like for me, all of my family, you know, all of my ancestors, so to speak, were in other countries. So they're not really a part of American history during that time frame. A lot of other people are like that, too. It doesn't change the fact that, you know, the Confederate flag, the stars and bars, does represent racism, racial oppression, segregation, many other things, because that's what it was used to represent. Um... But the Stars and Stripes represent even more racism in the grand scheme of things. You could argue throughout the history of the world, no country's flag has been stained by more blood being spilled in the name of oppression, segregation, racism, or what have you, than the American flag. I mean, and frankly, you know, even if, let's say, you're a, you're a, a, a black American... You could sit there and believe that the system is stacked against you. You could believe that you're being oppressed even to this day because you're right and it's true. But then the Native Americans would say, oh, excuse me, uh, at least you get to don't have to live on the reservations. I mean, 
Manifest destiny. Boy, if that ain't a fucking white American type of philosophy, I don't know. It God made it so we could sit there and take it over. It's for us. Oh, Christ almighty. All right, I would like to get to more of these questions, but that's all I'm going to do for now. Maybe I'll come back in a day or two and answer more of them. So thanks to you guys that went to Facebook and posted these questions. I'll see you later.